My name is Bruce Greeno. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors on the, the staff here at, at Community Presbyterian. Uh, many of you uh, know, most of you know, that our uh, senior pastor, Mark Patterson, is on sabbatical uh, this uh, spring and into the summer. And uh, we're taking this opportunity uh, uh, ourselves uh, to, to uh, as I've kind of described it, to, to, to lean back into the love and, and, the, and the goodness and the grace of God and and yet also try and discover what it means to push forward into what he has called us to be as those who would follow him. And, and, and so, you know, one of the th things that we're doing with this is trying to f figure out what it actually means to be called by God. And we've been looking at this little book that uh, Reverend Dr. Mark Laberton, the president of Fuller Seminary, has written. And simply, it's titled, Called. And he describes in the first few chapters of this book what our primary call is. When he, he, he writes that the very heart of God's call is to follow Jesus. To follow in this central activity. It's, 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 it's a following that is supposed to be born out in, in, our, in our character, in, in our lives, that we receive and we live the love of God for us and for the world. But he also wants to make sure that, that we really clearly understand that, that we live at a time where the church is, is really in great crisis. Describes that crisis by saying the church is meant to be a flourishing community, living in and, and, and living out the love and the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet all too often, we turn the church into just an institution, a place where we go for religious instruction, to perform certain rituals, gather for programs and do projects. The world, Mark writes, needs a church that actually lives its call urgently. So this morning, we we'll want to take the opportunity and, and look at how it is that we're called. How is it we are called to be followers of Jesus? And this morning, we're going to look at the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, the whole chapter. So will you hear the Word of God as it comes to us from Romans chapter 12? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. 
Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for for your word. We thank you that we have this tremendous privilege of hearing your word, of reading it. Well, we pray that you would help us to understand it. Understand what it means to give our lives to it, to you. That we might bear the image of Christ. We might follow Jesus into this world. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, there's a lot to this chapter. We could look at length at this chapter. John Piper went through the whole book of Romans in something like eight years with his congregation. We will not be doing... That there are just a couple of things, though, that I would like to point to. As, as we use this little book called to help us uh, uh, dig deeper into God's Word about what it means to be called by God, I want to point out just really two things that I believe the 12th chapter here of Romans points to. We are all called to follow Jesus with all of who we are. And we are called to follow Jesus in community. Therefore, by the mercies of God, present your your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. First and foremost, we need to understand that, that when Jesus calls us to follow Him, We do so because He's done everything necessary to enable our following. And therefore, our following initiates out of gratitude. It flows out of thanksgiving for all that God has done to us in being absolutely, graciously merciful. We don't need to earn it. We don't need to prove it. We are called to follow. And we can Because Jesus has done everything necessary. The word here used for offering or presenting our bodies, which is really the the understanding of ourselves, our our whole lives. Not just our intellect, not just our feelings, but our lives. To to present or to offer ourselves is is a word used regarding presenting an offering for sacrifice. Giving up, to give over, to hand over. And, and therefore, this is our, 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 our sacrifice of celebration. Offering a, a, of thanksgiving for the reconciliation that has been offered over us, to us, for us, through the sheer mercy, the utter grace of God. And Paul calls this our, our spiritual worship. Actually, the, the word used in Greek is the same word that we get the word logical from. Our, our logical service, our reasonable response. God's been merciful. We've been given everything necessary for life and godliness. It just makes sense that we would offer ourselves living and whole to follow Jesus wherever he goes 
to walk in the same manner that he walks. But how do we, how do, we do that as a living sacrifice? I mean, that really is and ought to be kind of a strange concept. Usually when something gets sacrificed, it's put to death. It dies in the process of being sacrificed. In one sense, Paul often writes about Christ putting to death our natural lives, our sinful lives, and replacing our lives with His life, giving, making of us new creations. His death makes us brand new. But there may be another helpful image here that Paul might have in mind coming out of his own uh, Jewish heritage, one in which he was thoroughly aware of sacrifices being killed and laid on the altar. Dr. Skip Moan writes that Rabbi Bob Gorlick points out that there is only one set of circumstances where living sacrifice can apply in the Jewish concept of sacrificial giving. And that's when a sacrificial animal was brought by someone for an offering, and it was given to the priests, and the priests determined that it was indeed unblemished. It was pure, spotless, clean. And so it was taken, it was received by the priest as an unblemished sacrifice, and they took it to the altar, and just before it was actually slaughtered and laid on the altar, someone discovered, wait a minute, there, there's a blemish on it, it's actually not spotless. Garlic writes, what happens to such an animal? It's already been dedicated to God, it can't be returned to its previous owner. But it can't be sacrificed because it has a blemish. In this case, it was left to live the rest of its natural life in the temple flock. Now, in one sense, that's a really beautiful image, isn't it? I mean, you and I, we have been reconciled to God, we're justified. Jesus' blood poured out in his sacrificial death has made us absolutely clean in the eyes of God. That's a spiritual reality that exists right now for all of us who have received Jesus Christ. But it's also true that it's still being worked out, isn't it? I mean, we know our natural selves all too well. There is still this sanctifying process to become who we are already. Sort of that sense of we are and we are becoming at the same time. And so we have been invited into God's flock to follow the great shepherd, becoming more and more like him. Living sacrifices. You and I have been re reconciled to God. And now we're being transformed to bear his image. Listen to how Pastor Professor Eugene Peterson has translated the first verses here of Romans 12. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. How are we called to follow Jesus? With all of who we are and all that we have offered as a grateful response to all Christ has made us to be. Jesus didn't die so that we could reconcile God to our lives. Jesus didn't die on the cross and reconcile us to God so that we could simply be better versions of ourselves. That we could become more polite or, or better givers or more intelligent about Scripture. Scripture. 
Jesus died so that we could be utterly new and wholly his. And so Paul writes also, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect or whole. And be not conformed to to this world. Conformed comes from uh, the word that we get uh, schematics from. It it means to be shaped by the patterns and the forms and, and the fashions of the world. Transformed comes from the word where we get metamorphosis from. And that means to be made utterly new. To be wholly changed from one thing into something brand new. We a caterpillar is metamorphosed into a butterfly. Something wholly new. And now it, 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 it's difficult in the Greek to say whether this is, these two words are active words. In other words, we're involved in the process or they're passive. In other words, they happen to us. And in one sense, probably both. I mean, we can certainly allow the world to conform us, to shape us, to mold us to its own patterns and forms and ways. But in reality, we're just as complicit into whatever the world might do. We cannot blame anyone. And in the same aspect, it is Jesus Christ who makes us utterly new and invites us into the process of that becoming real by our participating, by our following Him wholly made new, that we might wholly follow Him. How are we? How are we called? We are called to follow Jesus with our whole lives. We often, uh, we often separate our lives out, something that just is not a part of the biblical understanding of our lives. We think of, uh, of our mind oftentimes separate from our heart, our spirit separated from our flesh, and it's just not there in Scripture. When we come to this, this sense of being conformed to the world, and this is a world that, that invites us into this, this really divided up world that makes no sense, where, where I, I can have my truth and yet be morally flexible or progressive spiritually, a spirituality that is always changing to whatever the culture wants. We compartmentalize belief to to mere thoughts, to convictions, to faith, to feelings. That's not the world of the Bible. Mind, heart, body, spirit, it is all one that is supposed to be transformed, made utterly new, wholly new. His life would become ours, that we would actively surrender, receive, and share in it. His heart's passion for people and the world becoming our passion. His character of obedience to God's word and God's way shaping ours. His will in complete alignment with the Father's, replacing our own self-centered wills. And when we ask, what's God's will for our lives? It, it, it's a different question than how can I get God to bless my will? Or how can I live fully as I see fit and have Jesus too? One helpful way of thinking about how we're called, maybe uh, the acronym that Rick Warren uses in his purpose-driven book, and uh, uh, Life and Church books, he, he uses the acronym for SHAPE. And to think about your whole self. All of us have been gifted by God. We have spiritual gifts. It's important for us to learn how and what those are. And and, and one way that we can begin to understand maybe God's gifting to us is to understand the rest of us. And that is that all of us have heart passions about certain things. Thanks be to God, we're not all passionate about the same thing. There are so many needs in this world that not any one of us can meet all of them. 
And yet all of us are not passionate about all of them either. And we all bring certain abilities and skills, things that we've learned over time, things we've been trained in, classes that we've taken, education we've been given. We don't bear the same abilities and skills. Thanks be to God. You'd be in great trouble if I had to fix your car. (laughs) But I can build cabinets. We all have different personalities as well. Most of us have probably taken Myers-Briggs tests. We know that personalities range all over the map. Thanks be to God. And all of us bring experiences into this life. Thanks be to God that the Word tells us that God can take every single one of our experiences and redeem them and use it for His good. does not mean that every experience is good. Some of us have suffered grievously. But God can use our experiences. How are we called? We are called holy serve a holy God. We're called into serving one another with humility and grace, with genuine love, unfeigned and without hypocrisy. How are we called? We are called holy by God into community as the whole body of Christ to serve together with our particular shapes all together. We're called into blessing one another and others together, seeking to pour the uncommon love of God as we've received it in Jesus into the lives of others, even those who are actively seeking to harm us. We are called to live with one another without malice, with forgiveness, with encouragement, and without expectation that they'll change We're not merely called to believe the gospel intellectually, to give our assent to the doctrine of salvation to Christ. Jesus came announcing the gospel as the reign of God breaking into the world. The gospel is meant to be lived. It is meant to be incarnated. It is meant to to, to literally come out of our flesh into the flesh of others. Lived out in relationships with one another. God calls our whole selves to be his righteousness as the whole community of his body in his reconciling the whole world to himself through Christ. God calls our whole selves to be his righteousness as the whole community of his body in his reconciling the whole world to himself through Christ. That's how we're called. And there are so many opportunities to do that together. Right here in in this church, it's amazing how the body is learning to serve together. We can see it in the times the body gathers to share food. It happens here on our campus. It happens down on Ventura Avenue. It happens in homes with those who've just given birth or who are sick or who are grieving. This happens when people share together out of their particular shape, especially realizing that Christ can redeem even the hard experiences, experiences like loss or addiction, share with others through grief support, recovery. Our community groups gather, not just simply to study, but to share life together, helping one another become a community of growing disciples, growing disciples. It's a body of believers discovering together how how to be living sacrifices, whole lives becoming holy Christ's whole body. It can happen in just the smallest way. One of the ways that has profoundly impacted me that I hope is beginning to impact you came from Dick Power. He writes amazing little encouraging notes but he also passes on little books, books that are new and he's discovering might be helpful to either me or us. It was Dick who gave me the book called. It happens on grand scales as well. Ministries like Dos Pueblos, City Center, Signposts, 
so many others that many in this church have given their lives to serve. How does God call us? God calls us holy. Fully. To be living sacrifices. To be his righteousness as the whole community of his body. And his reconciling the whole world to himself through Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. For the opportunity and the privilege of being called to follow Jesus. Being given everything necessary to do so. Being given the example of Christ. Being given one another to serve with, to serve, by whom to be served. And we pray that, that, that you would continue to show us what it means to live in to whom we already are by the blood of Jesus and to live wholly yours, especially as the whole community of your body gathered together to be your hands and your feet, your eyes and your ears, your mouth and your heart. And you're reconciling the world to yourself through Jesus Christ. And it is in his name we do indeed hope we have prayed. Amen.